Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is uh, Series 3 of Wacana Ilmu Secara Webinar organized by Kementerian Pendidikan Malaysia and ELTC, or English Language Teaching Centre. And the title of this webinar is Classroom-Based Assessment, Issues and Challenges in Assessing Language Skills. I am Professor Aino. I'm going to be the moderator for this webinar. I'm a professor at the Kulia of Education IIUM and also a member of the ELSQC. Right, so this is a uh, webinar three of the series of webinar. And this webinar is special is that it is tied to what happened in uh, webinar two, uh, done on the 28th of April, 2020, 2022, uh, entitled Implementation of the CFR Aligned Curriculum, Issues, Challenges and Way Forward. So in the second webinar, the assessment issues or one of the things that we touch on is on assessment, classroom assessment. Okay? So this was presented in the webinar and a few issues crop up with regard to classroom classroom based assessment. When uh, they talked about when the panelists talked about classroom assessment, uh, which involves the process of collecting information about people's progress in the classroom and therefore teachers have to know the different ways or the different methods of assessment uh, of language skills uh, which is done classroom based and also with that there are a few elements to consider or the do's and don'ts and principles that need to be followed uh, as far as classroom based assessment is concerned so the methods of assessment will have to be address and teachers will have to know uh, what to do. And there are some principles of assessment. So if you go to the next slide, some people, principles of assessment that teachers will also need to be able to uh, need to know for them to make the best decision to, uh, in their uh, choice of the methods of assessment appropriate for their classroom teaching and learning. OK, so now let's go back to uh, today's webinar. Since I said that this is a continuation of the second webinar as far as dealing with classroom-based assessment is concerned, we know that with the introduction of the new English language curriculum, which is C4 aligned and therefore action-oriented, and as we saw in the uh, overview of classroom-based assessment in the slide uh, presented earlier, teachers' uh, approaches in assessment will have to change following the paradigm of school-based and formative assessment. So today, we're very fortunate to be listening to experts, experts in assessment and the practitioners and uh, um, uh, support group that uh, provide support for teachers in school with respect to assessment of student learning. And uh, we will be also enlightened with uh, issues and challenges uh, that teachers face in school as far as running or conducting school-based assessment at the school level. Okay. So let me introduce you uh, to the four panelists that we have today. First is uh, Dr. Abdullah bin Muhammad Nawi, a senior lecturer from UTM and an expert in assessment. Uh, he has taught and trained teachers in communication and in teaching English uh, to students from diverse uh, nationalities as well as uh, a background for the last 20 years. And uh, Dr. Abdullah is uh, also specialized um, in CFR Align Muet and he's been helping the MPM, Majlis Bapuriksa An, as far as not just aligning but also constructing assessment according to the CFR Align uh, language skills. Our second panelist is uh, Dr. Vanita uh, Tanabatlan, uh, who is the Head of Assessment and Evaluation Department at the English Language Teaching Centre, Kementerian Pendidikan Malaysia. She was awarded the Master Trainer Certificate by the Teacher Professional Division in 2016 and has seen uh, train a number of officers in SI. SC plus, uh, as well as 
teachers throughout the nation in various areas, as far as not just assessment, but also teaching and learning of English language in school. Okay. And uh, the two practitioners that we are very blessed and fortunate to have, our panelist number three, Puan Winnie Ong Yan Ni, who's a teacher, an English language teacher, currently teaching as, at SJKC Chua Hua uh, Empat in Kuching, Sarawak. She's been teaching for the last 16 years, so very vast number of years, and I'm sure very vast number of uh, uh, experience of us experience as well. She's also a master trainer for the CFR familiarization and learning materials adaptation and evaluation uh, for uh, the primary year one to year six. Our uh, next uh, panelist, panelist number four, is Nchik Vikram Menon, who's also a teacher uh, and a master trainer currently teaching at SMK Taman Kenari in Kulim, Kedah. He's been teaching for seven years and he has been uh, training uh, namely on materials adaptation, formative assessment, and at the secondary school also the PT3 CFR aligned test. Okay. So with the num vast number of experiences and the experts in this area, I think we are very, very blessed, we're very fortunate. So. I'm going to moderate by asking questions to uh, all four of the panelists. And I first will start with Dr. Abdullah. Uh, as an expert in the field of assessment, uh, educational assessment in higher education and educational assessment as a whole, can you share with us for a start, what are some of the important concepts in assessment? And what are some of the important principles that we have to be reminded of so that we will know uh, what, uh, how to go about to implement best practices as far as school-based assessment is concerned. Okay. So with that, I pass the mic to Dr. Abdullah. Uh, thank you very much, Prof. Ainon. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and a very good afternoon to everybody. My name is Dr. Abdullah Muhammad Nawi and I'm a senior lecturer at the Language Academy, the Faculty of Social Sciences and Humanities in UTM. I'm also a member of the English Language Standards and Quality Council of Malaysia, the same as Prof. Anil here. And also, I have a bit of a, a, a background in uh, testing and evaluation and assessment. It's one of my passions. Um, one of the reasons is because I am one of the panel members who designed the new CEFR aligned MUET and assessment is a topic that is very close to my heart. Um, so let me begin by starting with the basic uh, concept of uh, formative and summative assessments. Now, I'm sure that many teachers here have uh, are familiar with these two concepts where they exist in a spectrum and they exist in a spectrum. And on the one hand, you have the formative assessment. And on the other hand, on the other side, you have the summative assessment. But first of all, in order to understand what exactly they are, we have to break it down, break them down to understand what do they mean. So actually, it's actually a very simple thing to do. So if we break down the word formative, then we can see that the word form is there, form, forming, formation. So this type of assessment should form the student's development, the teacher's development, the teacher's ability to teach the students. And the summative evaluation is, if you break down the word, the, you have the word sum, summary. So it shows the sum of what the students have learned. So the sum usually comes right at the end. So normally you would have things like um, uh, end of semester examinations, end of your examinations. And if you go higher stakes, then you would have SPM, STPM, and so on and so forth. Now, they 
both exist on a spectrum. And on the one side, there is formative, and the other side, there is summative. And they can slide. And that's one of the concepts that we're going to be looking at today, because the whole thing gives at both formative and summative assessment, they have their role to play in the holistic assessment of a student's ability. Now, let's focus on the type of assessment that we're, we're focusing on today. So classroom based assessment, which is actually a part of formative assessment. Now, what are the, some of the typical features that we have in FA or formative assessment? And uh, number one, they help teachers identify students' ability and understanding closer to real time. Now, what does that mean when I say closer to real time? Imagine, if you will, that you are teaching a, a student a few concepts and you teach them throughout the whole year and you test them at the end. By the time you're testing them at the end, you still do not know whether they have grasped these concepts. However, if you carry out formative assessments, let's say you teach one unit and at the end of the unit, you have a little assessment. And I'm going to get to that term assessment where it doesn't necessarily mean to come up with a test. So you assess them. And from there, you will know whether the students have learned what they are supposed to learn. So the first important feature of FA is it helps uh, teachers identify students' ability and understanding closer to real time. And it is more for monitoring and getting feedback for the teacher to make corrective measures on what works, what doesn't work, how can I improve, what can the students do to improve, so on and so forth. And the FA additionally provides data or they, they provide information to the students on what they themselves are lacking in and what they need to work on. And the third and very important important feature of FA is that it is usually low stakes and in its purest form should carry no marks, no grading. Why? Well, we'll get to that in a bit. Now, when we, we, when we talk about grading, what does grading do? Um, grading gives students and teachers a number or a value to rate students' achievement, but it is a double-edged sword. On the one hand, if you don't have any form of marking, the students may feel that they don't need to participate in the evaluation, so they would be demotivated. <laughs> but on the other hand, when you introduce this element of marks, then they feel that they have to work towards it, thus working hard and trying and participating because they want the marks. However, again, this concept of a double-edged sword comes in. Too much of that and they may feel pressured, the teachers may feel pressured, the students may, feel, uh, may be pressured, which may result in other complications. Now, the, the FA we have at school, as far as I understand it, carries marks. It's not pure FA. It's where you have the formative assessment, but at the same time, they're graded, and these grades carry across right up until the end, uh, the end of the semester or the end of the year. And what this is now is that we slide up the continuum a little bit. So this in turn is actually a form of formative summative assessment, but it's still within the realm of formative assessment. And this is where CBA lies. Now, if you look at the philosophy of uh, FA, the focus is on forming, formation and 
feedback to the students, to the teachers, where even the simplest act of asking students to raise their hands, do you understand this? Yes, I do, or no, I don't. That itself is a form of FA. So now you have some idea that FA doesn't necessarily mean having to come up with complicated tests. Simple things like asking students what they learnt, writing it down, doing an exit ticket of some kind. Now, these are some forms of FA. Now, why do you need this? It's because these so-called assessments, they inform the teacher of the minute details of progress in the students and thus enable the students to make whatever improvements that are needed to make the teaching and learning process better. And I believe that teachers do this all the time, right? And now let's move on to the, the, the issue of how FA is carried out at schools. So at schools, it is now labeled as CBA, classroom-based assessments. And again, as far as I'm aware, the system is they're given the tasks or the tests, which they complete, they're awarded marks, and then these marks are reported. Now, to make this fully FA, now this is one of the things which I believe is very, very important. FA or formative assessment does not exist just as a form of assessment. There needs to be a follow up to what is done with the results of the assessment. How does this affect the teaching? How does this affect the learning? How are the findings shared with the students? What do you do with the findings? What do they do with the findings? Thus, a feedback loop that is introduced by this is very important. Can we go to the next slide, please, once again? So in this feedback, uh, in this feedback, informative assessment feedback loop, now, as you can see, what happens or what should happen is this, FA, does not exist just as a form of, okay, assess the students, let's get the marks, thank you, bye-bye, and let's come to the next one. That doesn't make it a complete round of FA because the most important thing to do with FA is you obtain the results, you ask yourself, how much do my students know, which then leads to how can I improve my teaching, which leads to how can the students improve their learning, which leads to, again, how do I test this? And then you obtain the results. So within FA, the concept of feedback and making corrective measures is very, very important. And this is why FA should not be something to shy away from. In fact, if you look at it this way, it should be something that is looked forward to because then the student will know, have I learned what I need to learn? And if I haven't learned it, then my teacher will now know what I don't know and will then make me know what I need to know. So this is where the value of FA lies. Now, it should be embraced and not something to shy away from. But that doesn't mean that there is no room for summative assessment. It's a balancing act. And this is something that uh, people who are familiar with testing and evaluation are greatly familiar with because there is no perfect test, but that's another topic for another day. Uh, thank you, Prof. I know that's uh, a little bit about the concepts of uh, FA and SA. All right. And thank you, Dr. Abdullah. Uh, thank you indeed for highlighting to us the very important principles that we have to be reminded of when we talk about FA. So you mentioned about the formative assessment in its purer sense, it's not about giving the grades, mm -hmm. but in practice, 
performative assessment lead to uh, giving marks or points to the uh, students in such that becomes a summative in nature as well. So this is where reporting has to take place. Mm. And um, apparently what is happening in school is, is, is that, that teachers have to do reporting of a student's progress or student's achievement uh, in the classroom-based assessment practices. So what is your take on um, this reporting thingy? What, what, is, what are the do's and don'ts such that this reporting is not going to be a burden to teachers in school? Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Prof. I know it's, it's a very interesting question and it's one and the answer may make me popular in one circle and hated in another. <laughs> we'll see what happens after this. So I have two views on this and number one is the view of pure FA, meaning to say that the assessment is for monitoring and feedback. Now, for this pure FA, I don't believe that we should have any type of marks associated with the FA. The FA exists for monitoring alone and feedback alone. It's more of the students have achieved this than the teacher then can know what to do. So not so much of the marks, but maybe scales of what has been achieved and more of the notes, more on the note side, what do the students need? So I believe that this is this is more important. What do the teachers intend to do as a result of the feedback? So when I talk about pure FA, it's not so much for the ministry, is not so much for the higher ups, but rather it's on a micro level where this is what's happening teachers can then take whatever that whatever you need whatever they need to do however now again however this ties in with the second view that i have on the matter and that is that especially currently right now there is a vacuum uh, that was left behind with the abolishment of these high stakes exams. For example, the abolishment of UPSR, PMR, PT3, and thus the question then goes to, but how do we know they've learned what they should have learned? So like it or not, again, I talk about the concept of balance there and, uh, and balance is a very big issue when we talk about assessment there needs to be evidence because then how do you know that they have learned what's to, what's to stop the teacher from writing something down and then not really writing down what's really happening or maybe that the teacher is ill-equipped to write down what they're supposed to notice and uh, there's this part there's this whole question on training and standardization and so on but there does need to be some form of evidence collection and this is something which is a sore point because here on the one hand i concur we need the evidence where do we get the evidence from the teachers but being an a former teacher myself at secondary level and now at tertiary level and uh, being involved in various parts of the machinery of the uh, education in this country and the fact that my wife is also a teacher <laughs> the truth is that there is just too much to do there is too much evidence to collect, too many forms to fill in, too much to upload, waking up at 3 a.m., uploading system crashes, crying the whole night, waking up again and crying again, soft copy, hard copy, and there does appear to be a lack of standardization across the board. Now, I know the 
answer to this is, but there is standardization. Yes, there is a push for standardization. However, if you ask practicing teachers on the ground, you can even ask from school to school. You will find that the interpretations of the procedures may vary, all depending on how the Pengetua or the GPK, how do they like it? If they feel that what the ministry is doing is not enough, I'll give one example. These are, these are real everyday examples. Uh, the system that, that, that is needed is, is online, but they're not familiar with all these things. So what did they do? They asked this, the teachers to print out everything, fill in online, fill in offline, Online uh, has been uh, uh, uploaded, offline put in a, a, a folder, send it here, send it there. So you end up, the teacher ends up teaching for 30% of the time and 70% is done on these other things, half of which don't make sense. Now, this is where we as policymakers, we need to find out what's, what's going on. How do we support these teachers? How do we support the process? How do we simplify the process? How do we upgrade the infrastructure to follow these changes to be upgraded in tandem with the simplification of the process? Now, it's a, it, it's a very hard question to answer, Prof. Aino, like I said, <laughs> the reporting. But the most important thing is, again, let us not forget the focus of FA. Focus of FA is not so much of reporting to the ministry, although it would be nice for them to know. We should never forget that the focus of FA is micro. It's for the teacher. It's for the student, it's for the classroom. Everything else is secondary. Thank you, Prof. Aino. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Abdullah. Very clearly said and uh, very useful to be reminded of when you talk about the pure FA that is meant to monitor the learning that has taken place um, in the teaching and learning. And uh, the, the notion of feedback, the importance of the teacher's role in giving the feedback so that the students are aware of their weaknesses and strength and the way forward. Okay, all right. So that's from the principles and the concepts of FA. Now let's listen to the practitioners from the ground. We're very fortunate, very, um, we've got two uh, teachers from one from primary and one from secondary school. And they are also master trainers from the ministry. So uh, let's start with Puan Winnie. Could you share with us? So let's listen to what happens in the grounds. How do you carry out formative ass assessment in your English language classes as far as assessing language skills are concerned? Puan Winnie? Thank you, Prof. Good afternoon, everybody. Okay. So in light of the uh, abolishment of UPSR examination, um, formative assessment has become more important. OK, so therefore it is very crucial that formative assessment or FA need to be carried out in each of our lessons because it helps to bridge between the gap of teaching and learning. So in my lesson, I will always make sure that these five main criteria are being adhered to when I plan for my lesson. Can we have the sharing of the slides? Yes. These five main um, criteria when I am doing my lesson planning. To help me to illustrate more, let's have a look at an example of a lesson plan which I have uh, done in one of my class. Okay, so number one, the first criteria that I have mentioned just now, learning standard. We have to take the correct and appropriate learning standard given in our scheme of work, or in short, we call it the SOW. 
Okay, so this is a lesson for a year four lesson. Okay, next, after we have obtained the correct learning standard, we have to set, we have to write, we have to determine the smart learning objectives okay, that we want our students to acquire according to the skills. Okay, now what are smart learning objectives? So what is smart? Smart basically means what is as specific, M, measurable, A, achievable or attainable, R, realistic, and T, time bound. Okay, then after that, okay, now because if it is a productive skill, okay, such as speaking or writing, we will have to give them input or in other words, we have to teach. Okay, we have to teach them, right? So can we move on to the third step? Or the, sorry, the third criteria, the next slide, yes. Lesson development. After we have written out the appropriate learning objective, we have to develop our lesson so as to achieve the smart learning objective that we have laid out. As because this is a speaking lesson, which is also a productive skill, just like I have mentioned before, the teacher needs to give the input first. That's why I highlighted here, the teacher needs to teach. Teach by giving them the targeted speaking frame that you would want them to learn. That is the objective you have to share before we, uh, after we have determined the learning, smart learning objective, we have to share to our students, okay? Where are we going? This is our goal. Today, you're going to learn, okay, about the nationality and the country and its nationality. For example, the targeted frame, speaking frame, that I would want them to learn in this particular lesson is, he's from Brazil. He's Brazilian. She's from the US. She's American. So as you progress, as the lesson develop, you need to give them the time to practice this speaking frame. In this particular lesson, I have two speaking frame that I would want them to learn. That is uh, speaking frame number one and also speaking frame number two. After giving them the ample time to practice the speaking frame, okay, that would be the next part of the post lesson, which is the part that we will have to do formative assessment. We need to check whether the gap between teaching and learning is being breached. So in this particular lesson, I am doing the exit cut, whereby students are given a flag and they will take turns to describe their friends with the targeted speaking frame number one. What is it again? He's from Brazil. He's Brazilian. She's from the US. She's American. So by doing this exit card, I will be in uh, this formative assessment. I will be able to identify, okay, which particular students needed further help, okay? Then it will come to my fifth criteria, which is writing my reflection, okay? Probably it's something like most of the pupils will be able to achieve their learning objectives, okay? So in this particular lesson, I have jotted down, okay, who needed further assistance? Joel, Kathy, and Marion were given feedback to practice speaking frame one. These three students in particular, they need to work on this one. So the feedback that I would give them is to practice more. And I also assign peer coaching or peer assistance. 
okay, to help them to further learn and also to check their progress. So that's how I conducted a formative assessment in my uh, English language lessons. Thank you, Prof. Thank you. A wonderful exemplar of uh, how uh, using your lesson plan, uh, showing us uh, the uh, process of the teaching and learning, leading to your the choice of uh, the assessment uh, that took place uh, at the end of the lesson and particularly ties back to what Dr. Abdullah uh, mentioned earlier, the objective of this assessment, the choice of assessment that you, you uh, took or you chose was uh, for formative, that is to inform or to monitor that the students have achieved the objective of the lesson of the day, right? So wonderful example and we would uh, uh, learn more and uh, would like to see more if this is happening or how this is happening or how does it happen at the secondary level. So with that, um, I would like to welcome Jit Vikram to share uh, your uh, experience and uh, your thoughts in implementing the school-based assessment as far as formative assessment is concerned at the secondary level. So the mic is yours, Jit Vikram. Thank you, Prof, and good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon to teachers out there as well. Thanks for joining with us. Um, coming back to your question, for me personally, uh, like what Dr. Abdullah has pointed out, school-based assessment is a way of collecting information uh, about people's learning as well as uh, on my teaching as well. I, I want to know how well I teach them. It definitely helps me to understand my pupils better and allows me to reflect on my own teaching. Let me start with assessing skills like reading and writing. For reading, I usually use the materials from the textbook and workbooks. By workbooks, I mean the activity books that come together with the textbooks. They follow exactly the units and learning standards in the textbooks, which makes it quite easy for me to assess my pupils. Let's say, for example, I'm teaching reading skills in which pupils have to read a text and answer true or false statements. I will usually ask them to complete the reading activity on their own first. If I'm teaching a mixed ability class, I would ask them to complete the activity in pairs. While they are on it, I will be going around the class to check on the answers. This allows me to assess them to see if they can be able to answer on their own. When they are done answering, I would ask them to check with their peers, prob probably uh, with someone who's more proficient. While checking, people will be able to explain and justify their answers to each other. Then I will ask them to put down their final answers on mini whiteboards. And this helps me to check their answers quickly across the classroom. While discussing, they can be also be able to mark their own answers on a mini whiteboard. This can also be a form of self-assessment. Now, uh, whereas for writing, I seldom have any problem with assessing writing skill. I usually ask people to do their writing exercises in their exercise books. Uh, I encourage people to check each other's essays or emails, but of course with a checklist. I'll provide them with a checklist. Uh, let's say I'm teaching them to use, uh, teaching them to use the punctuation marks uh, accurately. When they are done with writing exercises, I often ask people to mark their friends' essays or emails using a checklist I give them. By checklist, uh, checklist, I mean a list of punctuation marks that I want them to use in their writings, often to check if they're able to use them correctly. Uh, I have no time to check them one by one, so I tell my pupils to check it for me. It makes my life and job easier. I also ask people to do gallery walks to read and comment on other people's essays. So far, these are among the things that I've been doing uh, in my class, in my lessons. Um, I'm sure teachers out there, they have a lot of other, um, other techniques or strategies that they have been using. Maybe they can just drop their comment on the comment box. And, and that's all from me. Thank you. Thank you, Jay Vikram. 
So again, we saw that uh, the classroom-based formative assessment involves teachers' choices of the strategies that they uh, choose for formative purposes, all in the spirit of monitoring whether the learning has taken place, whether the skills, uh, the, the students achieve the necessary skills or the levels or can do the tasks based on the action-oriented uh, curriculum standards. Uh, but uh, inevitably, we cannot run away from having to answer the question, so how much have the students achieved? And, uh, and I suppose from your experience, you will realize that not all of them will be able to achieve or will show the progress according to what the lesson aspires. So therefore, uh, could you share with us, uh, we'll start with uh, uh, Ponwini first, would you like to share some of your experiences? What happens if you find that students do not achieve or do not show the progress at the end of the lesson? Ponwini? Yes, thank you, Prof. Okay, first and foremost, we should always acknowledge that every child is different and they learn differently. That is why we always need to share with them what we want them to learn. Okay, after we share with them, we tell them where are we going. Set targets according to their learning abilities. Okay, then you assess, keep track on where are they now? Where is their learning progress now? You monitor the learning progress through questioning session, asking them questions, prompting them through discussion, through um, formative uh, assessment of a quick scan to check. Mm -hmm. And in order to get where we want them to go, we need to constantly make sure that we give constructive feedback to ensure that they understand the purpose of their learning and also provide them with uh, encouragement or information on what they have done successfully. And if they have not done what we want them to do or they are not there yet, okay, what needs to be done? Tell them what is the next step of learning to acquire the skills that we want them to learn. And for the weaker ones from my side, I feel that assigning the weakest learners with peer coaching and mentoring really helps along this learning journey. That's all from my side, Prof. Thank you. Thank you, Bonwini. <clears throat> so this ties back to what Dr. talks about the principle of FA which is not about achievement to compare students, but rather we want to monitor progress. So the practice of uh, formative assessment to monitor individual pro progress, such that uh, when Ponwini when, uh, said, what we will give to the students are feedback and uh, constructive uh, feedback that will help them to know where they are and how to improve themselves. Okay? So wonderful. Uh, Vikram, so would you share with us uh, from the uh, secondary school practices. How do you bridge those gaps? What are not things done uh, based on your experience that will bridge the gap or will help the students in their learning uh, progressing? The mic is yours. Thank you, Prof. Um, I, I, I like the way Juan uh, put it out. Like she said that not every child is, same, is the same. Every child is different. It, the same thing applies to secondary school. Uh, bridging uh, has always been a problem to teachers uh, when people who do not reach the required level of proficiency move to the next level. Uh, maybe can I have the next slide on, the easier? Um, I always find it difficult to carry out intervention plans for these peoples while still teaching them the new learning standards. You know, I still have to teach them new things while still give them intervention plans to to reach to uh, to reach the, the the level that they did not reach in the previous year uh, but this year however i think most teachers would agree with me that the catch-up plan uh cup like we 
fondly call it, has been very helpful to us in supporting these weak peoples. The first few weeks of the first uh, school term was spent to address the needs of the peoples who did not achieve the minimum performance levels. So uh, what happens is that what happened in the school is that we were able to focus on these peoples by giving them extra activities in areas where they lacked to help them achieve the minimum performance level or help them learn the skills that they missed during the online classes. For example, uh, for reading, I tried to give them some exercises on certain learning standards they, they missed learning by letting them work with other more proficient peoples. This uh, surprisingly encouraged, has encouraged them to learn the learning standard with the help of a friend. Though I believe that the, the catch-up plan was initially introduced to support those who did not follow online classes during the pandemic, I think that the catch-up plan can also be a good revision plan for teachers to focus on weak peoples uh, even before starting the new academic year. I, I would be very glad or very grateful if the catch-up plan is included in our yearly teaching plan in future because it gives teachers some space and opportunities to fix problems that people face even before start teaching them the new learning standards. Uh, that's all from me. Thank you, Prof. Thank you, Javikram. So if I can summarize, based on uh, both your input, uh, I can say that uh, uh, the result of the assessment that are uh, um, chosen for formative purposes is not about just what the teachers should be doing, but how they plan for the next thing to happen. So it doesn't have to be something that the teachers have to give uh, or to, to do extra work on or to have to plan uh, more. But it's rather the different strategies that are available and the teachers need to know what are the ways or what are the strategies to bridge the gap. And you have also given an exemplar of uh, things that can happen can come from, uh, from uh, teachers' own initiative. Or it can be a structured one like the catch-up plan that is being shared by uh, Jeff Vikram. Okay, I don't seem to want to let go of the two of you yet. There's one last question for the two of you that we would like to uh, hear, which is about the challenges. The last two years, we've been challenged by the pandemic, but education still uh, has been taking place. So what are some of the challenges in teaching and learning of language skills? as far as secondary and primary are concerned over the last two years that we would like to hear so that will be something that we will learn and improve on. So let's start with Vikram. Could you share with us some of the challenges in uh, teaching language skills, especially during this pandemic and um, uh, post-pandemic? Thank you, Prof. I mean, uh, if I start talking about the problems we had during the pandemic could be, it would take the long, it would take, it would take the whole session, but I'll just keep these problems to, uh, to school-based assessment. So, well, as far as school-based assessment is concerned, one problem, uh, one common problem uh, that I had during the school closure is that marking people's written work over the internet. I used to tell my people to take pictures of the essays or other written work and send them to me through Telegram or WhatsApp, but uh, marking them on WhatsApp and Telegram was a bit difficult and daunting for me. Then I changed my strategy. I told my people to submit the essays on Google Classroom, but many complained that their mobile devices were not convenient to do that. So I saw, uh, sorry, I got advice from other English teachers and they suggested using applications like Quizist and Google Forms. These applications allow people to submit their essays without having to use much of the mobile data. One great thing about these applications is that they can auto mark people's short responses and they also allow people to get instant feedback. As all these data are recorded in the applications, I did not need to think of ways to record my people's progress. I used those data as evidence to avoid performance levels to my peoples when it comes to the year-end um, classroom-based assessment reporting or PBD reporting. 
Now, the other common problem we faced was people's not attending online classes. I think most teachers would, would relate to it. There were many reasons to it. Uh, when, when we asked them, some said that they were sharing devices with other siblings. A few others were already working in the nearby factories, and many said that they overslept. It was rather a difficult situation to end. When they missed online classes, it became difficult for teachers to award them a performance levels for CB, uh, for classroom-based assessment reporting or PPD reporting, as we did not have any evidence to decide on their performance levels. I, at my school, however, to however to help us out with this issue, we sought the counselors' help to contact the parents of the people who frequently skip online classes. Uh, on my part, what I did was I recorded lessons. Uh, recorded videos, uh, recorded lessons, and send them to the peoples so that they could watch the videos when they were free. If let's say they were working, when they come back from work, then they, they, they could find some time to watch my videos. Together with the videos, I also send them instructions to complete exercises. Uh, after completing the exercises, they would then send them over to me. Uh, this is very important so that I could have, I could rely on the exercises to assess the understanding of particular lessons. Um, so far, this, these are the things that I can think of right now. Um, and maybe teachers can comment on how they are, what are the problems they have faced and how they have tackled them. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, So uh, if I can summarize, so those are the two things that are actually common even in uh, higher education. One is about the digital and technology issues, and the other is, of course, because the pandemic is affecting people in different ways, so the psychosocial psycho issues also come in in the teaching and learning. Uh, Winnie, so what do teachers do to adapt to all these changes due to the pandemic? Can you share some of your experiences? Okay. All right, on this note, I would really like to applaud all the teachers out there in adapting to the abrupt changes in teaching due to the pandemic. Okay, we could see nowadays that many teachers have taken the initiative to learn and acquire new ICT skills to ensure continuous teaching and learning, even among senior teachers who are going to retire soon. Okay, um, PPDs also and schools have also uh, given the necessary training and workshop to teachers for this purpose also. Okay, and we can see also teachers have also invested quite substantially in financial terms in gadgets and devices to make sure that teaching and learning online process are more conducive. Okay, um, there also, I agree with uh, Mr. Vikram, there are lots of uh, online learning tools such as our Google Forms, our Quizies, okay, and video presentations. All these could be saved in our Google Drive of our MOE account, and it can be retrieved at any time as we want. Okay, all is just a click away. We have been blessed with such uh, convenience at our fingertips by the Ministry of Education. Um, so we have to make full use of it. In a nutshell, we have to have a growth mindset, okay? A growth mindset to adapt to whatever changes, to adapt to whatever challenges that are thrown to us. I also believe that what doesn't break us will make us stronger. So that's all from me. Thank you, everybody. Probably the teachers would like to share as well how they have um, make the necessary changes in terms of teaching. OK, thanks, Prof, from my side. Okay, thank you, Ponwini. Thank you, from Your sharings are all very insightful uh, experiences. Very uh, to hear, uh, brings out all the things that are uh, reality yeah, in the classroom. and. Um, I wish I have more time, but I've got to go to the next speaker, Dr. Vanita from the ELTC. Uh, and um, with you, Dr. Vanita, could you uh, tell us 
uh, how has or what are some of the programs that ELTC has in order to help teachers to be more effective in their formative assessment practices? The mic is yours. Thank you, Prof. From my own, a very good afternoon to everyone. Yeah, as an uh, in-service uh, training institution, the LTC is certainly very concerned with the issues and uh, problems faced by teachers with regards to the implementation of the classroom-based assessment. Um, we have seen many issues in uh, uh, through our training. And uh, I think basically there's a large misconception of a huge misconception of uh, formative assessment and summative assessment. And, uh, you know, uh, I think there's lack of understanding among teachers to see this two, two types of assessment as a whole process that what one complements the other as what Dr. Abdullah has mentioned just now. So yeah, back in 2020, uh, ELTC sat with the Teacher Training Institution, IPGM, and the Examination Syndicate, Lampaga Papriksaan, and we came up with a program called Assessment Literacy. Now, the aim of this program is to enhance teachers' knowledge and skills in assessment. So basically, this uh, program is leveled at two uh, groups of teachers. One is for preschool teachers, and the uh, program is offered at a diploma level. The content is pitched at diploma level. And for the other EL primary and secondary school, the program is pitched at degree. So um, basically, we have three courses under this uh, program. Uh, the first course is concept and principles of school-based assessment. Uh, here we get, we, we allow teachers to uh, experiment, okay, the concepts and principles underlying assessment. Concepts like validity, reliability, practicality, and how these concepts can be actually translated into principles for language development. So that's one thing that we see and is well accepted by the teachers. The second course uh, concentrates on CFR. Now we all know that our curriculum has been aligned to CFR, so uh, they need to understand. But this is not so much of uh, a curriculum course, this is an assessment course. So basically what we do is we help teachers to translate the can-do statements into learning outcomes. And we also get them to experience strategies, assessment strategies to assess these uh, learning outcomes. Again, this also went very well with the teachers, well accepted. And I think they really understood some of the concepts that we were trying to give them. And the third course, designing instruments uh, and reporting procedures for this, we actually get them to explore okay, the different types of instruments, both traditional and also the alternative, uh, assess, uh, alternative instruments. So we have run this program since 2020. And uh, of course, uh, through the training, we have discovered different needs from different parts, uh, different groups of uh, uh, teachers. And what we have now come up is uh, come up with is a new idea, a progression from this whole program. What is needed at this point of time by the teachers? So we came up with this new. Uh, it's not so much a new, but it's an a, 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 an establishment of the existing program. So we are going to focus on three main areas. One is on designing instruments, okay, uh, both traditional and alternative. Number two, number two is how do you actually understand the requirements in the DSKP, the performance standards? What are the, you know, uh, the, the, the requirements that each 
level of this DSKP. Without understanding the requirement, you will never be able to assess your students systematically. And thirdly, we are also coming up with a plan to help teachers see strategies on how you can actually make professional judgment. Now, if you're talking about formative assessment, you cannot run away from making professional judgment. So how do you actually make professional judgment? Now, without the knowledge of the above two, I don't think anyone can make professional judgment. So these are the three things that we are looking at. And this came about from a small pilot study we did in Trunganu with a group of secondary school teachers. And we thought that it is important that we focus on these three aspects first. Of course, in line with all these things that we are doing, we have planned to uh, go further and train more teachers. At this point of time, we are looking at 1,000 teachers by October. Uh, for primary school and probably will go further for secondary school teachers. So basically, this is what we are focusing on, on what is needed by the teachers at this point of time. Yes, that's all, Prof, for now. Thank you, Dr. V. Okay, yeah. Dr. V, there's no more UPSR and there's no more PT3. Parents and students are saying so they don't have a they don't have the milestone to tell them what's the proficiency level of their children and if talking about the students they don't know their proficiency they hmm. they are they are lost as if they are lost and they're worried they the parents are worried that they don't know how this uh, children have achieved so what can or what should the teachers do. Because we've listened to what the teachers are, are doing as far as school-based assessment from uh, Jake Vikram and uh, uh, teacher uh, Winnie. So what should they do so that this information is translated to the students and probably to parents? So they are not worried uh, since we don't have all these national examinations anymore, but they still yeah. would know what are the weaknesses and strength or what was the level of their uh, children as far as the language skills are concerned? Mm. So what can the yeah, yeah. That's an interesting question, Prof. And I think this question is not new. Uh, basically, parents are concerned about grades, you know. But we must understand that at the end of the road, okay, whatever we are doing in the classroom, the outcome is proficiency, whatever we are doing in the language classroom, okay? The outcome is to reach a certain level of proficiency, all right? So assessment is one part that we, are, we need to do systematically. If we are systematically assessing speaking, for example, at the end of the, 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 uh, the, the schooling term, the child will be able to speak at a specific level, proficiency level. So that's one thing we need to know. So assessment is important. But going back to your question, what do we do to inform students, to inform parents that this is the level that their children is at? So I think education is important. What I mean by education is we need to inform parents that at this point of time, the child is doing this much. So going back to reporting procedure that what Dr. Abdullah was mentioning just now. So you see, uh, the latest policy that we have for assessment is Pemerkasa and Pentaksiran Berasaskan Sekolah, PBS. So under PBS, under this Pemerkasa and policy, we are looking at both formative and summative, right? So formative, should inform the summative. So if in February you are saying that the child is able to do this much and the evidence that you have collected is from the flags that you have done, Winnie has talked about, or anything that you have recorded, that's the evidence that you share with the parents and saying that this is what the child is doing. And again, you must remember, it's not comparing one child to another child. Formative assessment is about the progress of each individual child. 
when it comes to a time when in june for example you are given a specific instrument where you actually run with the students in 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 the whole class and you do it summatively that the way of you reporting is totally different now that is high stake reporting so you are actually comparing child a child b child c because you want to see how much the progress of your entire 6 months lesson so this is something that we need to understand very clearly and i think you we need to explain this to parents the reporting procedure as what dr abdul has mentioned is very important when it comes to formative assessment summative assessment is simple because they see the grade they see the marks they know but what is not confidently related to parents is the formative assessment so i think one way of looking at this is to go back to the style of assessment how do you actually systematically do this assessment you need to understand it's a, you're the principles of assessment behind the instrument that you are using even if you are doing a worksheet for example for your formative assessment you need to know whether what uh, the content of the worksheet complies with the topic that you are doing so you have content validity whether it complies to the language ability you are looking at for example a2 b1 whether the vocabulary in the worksheet that you are giving you are testing is at that level so it goes back to the principles of assessment so what happened has happened along this way of formative assessment is that people think that you don't need to have to know uh, how an mcq item works how uh, open ended questions are formed which is wrong you need to know the specifics of assessments so that you do it systematically and when you report you are confident to report that i have done this this worksheet complies to the principles of assessment and this is how the students are faring so it's a whole process and i think coming from eltc english language teaching center what we are doing is building this literacy assessment literacy among our teachers it's a long way but at least we have started I think that's that's all from me, Prof. If there's any other questions, yeah. Thank you, thank you. I'm sure from the audience there are many questions that have come up, but uh, I've got to ask my last question because uh, time is running out. So my last yeah. question is to Dr. Abdullah. What's the way forward? So we um, think we have moved towards this. We're doing it. So what 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 are the things? What are the way forward? in your perspective how we should be doing it so that we will be an exemplar to other countries and also be doing things the right way so um, back to you dr abdullah uh, <coughs> thank you very much uh, prof aino uh, right now it's raining heavily outside yeah <laughs> so i'm just not sure how much of the sound is going to carry through <laughs> but i'm hoping that the mic is uh, okay uh, right so actually dr vani has uh, has um, <laughs> talked about quite a lot of the things uh, and she's completed the whole range of what we have uh, here today um but just let me finish up by um, uh, giving just a little bit more of uh, some thoughts that i have um and again the, the it could be that my definitions may differ slightly but the whole the principles are are, are the same so um first of all when when we talk about now th there are two there are two main terms that we've heard being used today uh three so you have summative assessment and you have formative assessment so that's of that but you also have cba which is classroom based assessment so um right now uh, for me in in my understanding uh, again between different practitioners there may be different uh, uh, differences in in the way uh, we understand certain certain concepts and the way we use them um but the principles are similar so 
Um, I feel that, that there is a demarcation between the terms that I've used where, uh, first of all, we talk about FA and CBA. Again, if you recall, um, when I talk about using FA, I talk about FA in the purest sense, uh, which is these minute assessments that help the teacher to see what's going on. And the other one, for my, in my understanding of the CBA, is the, the way you have certain assessments that you have to do throughout. For example, physics, they have the PECA and, 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 and whatever, where there, there are assessments that where you get marks and you have to, but they're carried out throughout the whole year. So th that's uh, my understanding of, of CBA. It could be that it's a, a different understanding. But again, it's the spirit of, of uh, that's important, yeah? So um, um, I, I would argue that CBA is more aligned with the current education um, uh, climate that, that we're in. And with CBA, I feel that there needs to be a few more aspects to consider on top of what has already been considered by the panel. And the first is that, and I do believe that Dr. Vani has, has talked about this. The first is that the teachers and the students, they themselves need to understand um, that because that there are cumulative marks or system of marks, they need to make sure that they participate in the process. So it, it's, it's not just telling the students, hey, you need to do this, hey, you need to do that, but, but there needs to, they need to be part of the process. And I feel that um, this understanding is very important for practitioners to, to talk to the students to make sure that they understand why it's, this is being carried out. It's not just, I'm testing you, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, but they need to know why. What, what's the whole reason behind this? And I feel that that's the, the whole foundation um, of it. And when, they, when, when this happens, then uh, what will happen is there'll be a paradigm shift. And the paradigm shift is that instead of being pressured in doing CBA or in, any uh, form of assessments, uh, they will be comforted in the fact that this is done for them to progress, for them to understand more. There's more, um, uh, the, the, there's more uh, evidence to show uh, what the, the, the teachers need to do, the students need to do. So this paradigm shift is, is I think, one of the things that we need to, uh, to work on, which is the very foundation. And the next, I feel that there needs to be a mix between FA and CBA or what I talked about as pure FA and formative summative evaluation. I do feel that you do need these micro assessments, but also I do feel that you need to have some form of assessment where you have numbers and figures and you know there is this um this uh point where you can see you've achieved something or you or you've got an a you've got a b to, just to make it uh, just to simplify it so so there needs to be a mix between the two i don't think that you can do purely like dr Vani said before this there's, there's no pure it's it's hard to say okay this is divorced from the other it exists on a spectrum, and you need to mix those two, the, 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 those two together. And finally, or rather the second final point, is that there needs to be proper standardization and training. Now, again, I, I acknowledge that there has been this going on, but again, if you go on the ground, you will find that there are the interpretations may differ between different schools. And I think something needs to be done for to remedy that um, as best as we can. So standardizing the process and as well as simplifying the process, the process of carrying out the assessments, the process of collecting the evidence and showing that there's learning all this needs to be simplified so that the teachers are not overburdened i think whatever it is um, however complex the system that we try and make 
these it needs to be standardized and simplified so that the teachers are not afraid of using it and um, when everything is carried out and they meet both the formative and summative need, needs um, uh, I think that this if, if the students are used to this form of assessment right from the very lower uh, levels of uh, of education, meaning to say that primary school, and then they see that in secondary school that this is happening as well. And they're going to find that even in tertiary education that this happens as well. So there should be no no shock, no culture shock of, of why is it that we're doing this? Because uh, these principles are in use in all levels of education in Malaysia. So. I think that that's uh, basically it from me. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Ainal, and thank you for the the uh, the thank you to the other panelists as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Abdullah. Well, it looks like we have to come to the end of the session. Uh, I must say that the session has not just been very insightful, but also very enlightening because we have heard from all the four panels from the theoretical perspective all the way up to the ground. So what happens in the ground uh, from Ponwini, Jit Vikram, and even from Dr. Vanita in uh, giving support to teachers. And um, the objective of this webinar to be reminded is for this discourse to continue. So we really appreciate your comments and questions uh, that you post in the uh, chat. Uh, in the chat and uh, we, we hope to come in to enlighten you more with uh, answers and also to respond to your comments. So with that again on behalf of uh, the of Education, the LSQC and uh, LTC, I would like to thank all the uh, panelists, all four panelists, Dr. Abdullah, Dr. V, Dr. Vanita, uh, Ponwini and uh, Anjay uh, Vikram for your time and your precious sharing moment. Uh, we wish you all the best. Thank you everyone for attending. Uh, again, uh, as I said, we would like to continue the discourse. I'm sure all of you have got questions and comments, so we'll be happy to attend to them. So with that, uh, thank you. Thank you all and uh, stay safe. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye. -bye.